I became very interested in two things that I'm going to talk to you all about tonight. One is nutritional uh, genomics, and that'll be the subject of my next book that'll be out next January. And the other is toxico uh, genomics. Toxico genomics is uh, the um, study of how various environmental toxins uh, cause uh, cancer and how it happens over a period of decades. You know, one of the major things that Deborah and I uh, have both realized over the years is what is in our external environment. The environment out there becomes the environment in internal environment. It becomes what's inside you. And so, you know, we've really encouraged people, everybody has to become an environmental activist only because your health and your children's health, your grandchildren's health, is completely dependent uh, upon what's, what's in the air that you're breathing, what's in the water you're drinking, what's in the food you're eating. And what you can't see uh, doesn't mean that it's not there. Uh, because a lot of people really think if you can't see it, that it's really not there. And we know nothing could be further from the truth. And as an oncologist, I became very, very interested uh, not only in treating cancer, but helping people reduce the risk of ever getting cancer in the first place. Now, we're living in a country today where one in three people are going to hear the words, you have cancer. Unfortunately, when uh, I first started about 25 years ago, the statistic was one in three. They predicted by 2050 that it was going to rise to one in two. Uh, we're almost there now. Uh, so we're ahead of schedule. Uh, so if that's not an epidemic, I don't know what is. Uh, and we've got a lot more people surviving cancer. Um, but there are uh, a number of types of cancers, like childhood brain tumors, uh, again, which goes along with what Deborah's working uh, on is increasing significantly over the last 30 years. Uh, one in seven women will develop breast cancer. Uh, some people have said that's due to earlier detection, which is part of it. Um, so a lot of people think that if you're going to get cancer, uh, if you're going to get Alzheimer's, if you're going to get a number of these uh, diseases that uh, develop in life, that it's just bad luck or bad genes. Uh, but the fact of the matter is they've looked at identical twin studies. This was in the New England Journal of Medicine. Identical twins develop the same uh, disease only 10% of the time. And when you look at uh, the most common types of cancer, like breast, colon, or prostate, identical twins only between uh, 15 and 30% of the time will they get the same disease. So a lot of it has to do with the environment. And one of the key things I'm going to talk to you about tonight is it doesn't just have to do with the genes that you're born with. OK, you have the genes you know, half from your mother, half from your father. But you can control gene expression throughout your entire life based on the nutrients that you're putting in your body or the toxins that you're putting in your body. Next. Now, this is a little bit of a technical slide, but it illustrates a point uh, very well. So the uh, yellowish fat mouse you see up there is the mother uh, of the uh, thin, uh, dark brown, normal colored uh, mouse right next to it. And this study was done at Duke University by Randy Jertel, and it really illustrates the whole uh, point I was making about what we call epigenetics. So it's not about mutation. It's not about DNA damage. It's about affecting gene expression. So that mouse is called an agouti mouse. And it was bred uh, so that it uh, has a very yellow, uh, pale skin coat. It becomes obese at an early age. It becomes diabetic at an early age. And they develop a number of different tumors as they age. So they have a very short lifespan. When uh, these. When this mouse was fed uh, extra things during the pregnancy, uh, like betaine, which comes from beets, uh, B12, uh, folic acid, uh, it started giving rise to more of the normal uh, phenotype mouse, the normal uh, mouse that uh, is thin, does not become diabetic, does not become cancer. And the fact is that's heritable. 
which means that mouse can continue to produce normal mice down the line. And this has been shown in so many different things, both in humans and animals, like stress that a mother feels, uh, you know, and certain animals uh, will give rise uh, to certain conditions down the line that become heritable. Uh, so that it's passed on. So women with the BRCA1 or 2 mutation, uh, that only makes up uh, about 10% of all the breast cancer, maybe even a little bit less, but they have an 82% lifetime risk of getting either breast or ovarian cancer. Uh, so this was really popularized after Angelina Jolie made uh, the decision to have a bilateral mastectomy. Um, Dr. King uh, published a paper uh, where she looked at old serum samples and looked at women before 1940, before there was a host of all these environmental toxins that we're exposed to now that uh, women back then weren't, that the risk of breast cancer was 24% if you were born before 1940, but 67% if you were born after 1940. Same thing held for ovarian cancer as well. So a lot of these environmental toxins that have been introduced since World War II uh, have really predisposed to a number of things. So even if you have the gene for breast cancer, not all women develop it. And I have a huge number of men and women in my practice that are BRCA1 or 2 positive that we do a lot of preventative things that I'm going to talk to you about over the next few minutes. Next slide. So, Dr. Sheldon Feldman, Dr. Aronson, uh, these are two doctors that have really pioneered uh, looking at something called ductal lavage and look, uh, breast milk, looking to see what kinds of toxins are in uh, milk. Uh, so in mother's milk, uh, you can find a host that are class one carcinogens, um, and these are stored, so it's really no wonder that these get stored in fatty tissue, uh, and they stay there for decades and decades. Next slide. Um, toxic compounds uh, are present uh, in a huge number of uh, samples of fat, uh, whether it's from surgical patients uh, or other patients, and they found uh, that many of these uh, toxins are present in very, very significant levels. So everybody has at least 80 uh, to over 100 uh, carcinogens that they're carrying in their body. Uh, I test people for mercury toxicity. We find it in about 30 uh, percent of the people we test. Next slide. So if somebody is going to develop cancer, uh, it's very important for people to realize, let's say somebody uh, wakes up with a cough and they go to the doctor because it's not going away after a week. He does a chest x-ray, finds a lung mass, they biopsy it, and finds out the person has lung cancer. You know, that lung cancer didn't start the day the person developed the cough. It very often started decades before. And so, you know, some carcinogens are activated within the body. Uh, they can damage the DNA. They can also turn on certain tumor promoter genes. So even if they don't damage the DNA, they turn on uh, genes that will promote cancer. And it can be decades before a clinical cancer will show up. At any of these stages, there are phytonutrients and certain medications that you can use to interrupt that. And one of the things that I uh, think oncologists have really missed the boat on so far is the fact that everybody, you know, of all the 7 billion people in the world, everybody's walking around by the time they're 20 with cancer in their body. Now, we know that from autopsy studies where people in their 20s died in car accidents or wars. They do autopsies. They'll find uh, occult or dormant thyroid cancer, breast cancer, stomach cancer, colon cancer. Uh, in almost everybody. Many people have more than one dormant cancer. So, you know, we're the most rapidly evolving species on the planet. Our DNA is becoming mutated. We're exposed to environmental chemicals over the last sev several decades that our ancestors were never exposed to. And so the whole uh, point about the fact that everybody 
has dormant cancer really changes what the philosophy is. It's not to try and eradicate every last cancer cell in the body in a given patient. It's not possible. You're not going to make one person unlike the other 7 billion on the planet. The goal uh, for you, for wellness, is to keep any cancer cell in your body that's dormant, keep it dormant, not uh, so th that it doesn't become active. And if you've had an active cancer, you want to make it to where it becomes dormant uh, and keep it there. So there are a number of things that you want to try uh, and avoid. Uh, PBDEs or flame retardants, and those are found in a lot of mattresses. Uh, you can buy PBDE uh, free mattresses. They put them in children's pajamas, uh, which they definitely uh, should not be doing. Uh, the levels of these uh, in the human blo bloodstream and fat, fatty tissue samples are doubling about every five years. In the areas where they're the highest, it's, uh, there's a correlation. Uh, with breast cancer and other cancers. These type of uh, chemicals are also neurotoxins. Uh, there's some uh, study that uh, it may be correlated with learning disabilities, developmental disabilities, and autism. Next slide. Phthalates are endocrine disrupting chemicals. It means they act like weak estrogens. Uh, they're found in nail polish, uh, the soft plastic toys uh, that children often chew on. Uh, perfumes, skin moisturizers. You always want to make sure you're getting uh, phthalate-free th uh, toiletries, uh, cosmetic, things like that. And that's also been linked uh, to cancer and reproductive impairment. You want to avoid microwaving with wraps, uh, like saran wrap. It just uh, is putting dioxin into your food. Uh, you should always use uh, glass or ceramic things uh, to microwave in. Uh, even Tupperware uh, or Rubbermaid bowls are better. And avoid upholstered furniture or foam products that have been treated with uh, flame retardants. Um, avoid dishwashing detergents uh, with chlorine and phosphates uh, because when you uh, open the dishwasher, all that mist uh, goes in. The chlorine uh, is converted in the body to different carcinogens. Uh, you want to really be careful uh, with cell phone and other uh, electronic uh, items. Remember, distance is your friend. You know, a lot of people are walking around talking with it right next to their ear. It's going right in through the skull to the brain. Uh, you would want to avoid using cell phones with weak signals because the weaker it gets, the more it's trying to uh, attract. Uh, the uh, original antenna, uh, and a lot of that radiation goes into you. Uh, don't keep them next to the body. Uh, use wired rather than wireless when possible. Uh, use your sp speaker phone or a hands-free device, and you don't need to keep it right next to your bed. Other things you can do, use baking soda uh, to clean sinks, tubs, and toilets rather than chlorinated uh, chemicals. Uh, vinegar in a pump spray bottle is very good for cleaning mirrors, windows, uh, chrome. You should always go with green, toxic-free uh, cleaning uh, solutions for your house. Vegetable oil with lemon juice is a great furniture uh, polish. Those of you that are using bleach, you can continue to use it. They make a number of non-chlorine bleaches now. Chlorine bleach uh, is highly potentially carcinogenic. It's toxic to the lungs. Uh, its byproducts are chloroform and other chlorinated hydrocarbons, all of which have uh, caused DNA damage. And uh, they're also uh, xenoestrogens, meaning they have a weak estrogenic uh, activity. Hydrogen peroxide, again, uh, there are a number of bleaches made uh, with this that are now available instead of chlorinated bleaches. Next slide. Uh, borax is one of those. Uh, also use non-bleached coffee filters. There's a lot of chlorinated products in all coffee filters, especially the white ones. You always want to buy the non-bleached ones uh, because then you're just drinking it. Uh, skip synthetic air fresheners. Um, and uh, even, you know, all things like incense, things like that, there are a number of uh, uh, byproducts there that are linked to a number of types of cancer. Um, also, you want to use uh, a green uh, dry cleaners where they're not using trichloroethylene. Uh, 
Uh, a lot of cleaners have switched over to this, but you want to just make sure. Also, uh, the play sets that you see, you want to make sure uh, that they uh, don't have arsenic-related things to keep bugs out. You want to get all natural wood uh, from those uh, because the, the arsenic is very clearly uh, a carcinogen. Also, even the resins, uh, like in your shelves in your house, those can off-gas uh, things like formaldehyde for decades. So one of the things, uh, now that I've probably depressed everybody about all these things, uh, there's a lot of uh, you know, very key things that people can do uh, to protect themselves and their children against cancer uh, from all the toxins that are here. One, your first line of defense are what are called your detoxifying enzymes. Those are found in every organ in the body. Uh, most abundant in the liver, but they're also found in the lung. Uh, we discovered at Strang that a lot of people who were developing smokers who developed lung cancer in their 40s were not able to detoxify the main carcinogen in cigarette smoke. So it's sort of hard to know how well you detoxify. You want to put a lot of things in your body that can increase on an epigenetic level. So literally, there are foods like garlic, omega-3 fatty acids, resveratrol found in the skin of red grapes, turmeric, which is what gives curry its yellow color. Those all work at the level of DNA to increase the body's production of detoxifying enzymes. Now, why is that important? Well, you saw how the carcinogens are ubiquitous. Uh, Kathy Helzauer at Johns Hopkins looked at women with and without breast cancer and looked at one of the most uh, common detoxifying enzymes called GST, or glutathione S transferase. She found women with the lowest levels of GST had a fourfold increased chance of developing breast cancer compared with women with normal levels. Uh, the cruciferous vegetables. Now, these are broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, and cabbage. Both men and women, you can't consume enough of these. You should make sure you include these every day. Uh, now, the first thing I'm going to mention is breast cancer prevention. So there's something in cruciferous vegetables called indole-3-carbinol. Now, that can be uh, purchased as a supplement. Uh, there's a more stable, better absorbed uh, variety called DIM or diindolmethane. And so there's two types of estrogen metabolites in the human body. There's a 16-hydroxyestrone and a 2-hydroxyestrone. And so what happens again on an epigenetic level is the indole-3-carbinol is basically able to convert the 16-hydroxyestrone to the 2. So most American women are walking around with a predominance of 16-hydroxyestrone. That hangs around in the body for a long time, and it's mutagenic, so it promotes breast cancer. That's where most of it is. So when estrone uh, or estrogen is metabolized, it has to go to one of two different places. It can either go to the 16 or it can go to the 2. The indole-3-carbinol is one substance that's able to shift most of it from the 16 to the 2 which doesn't hang around long, it's converted into the body, and it's a very, very weak estrogen. For men, it's equally important. It's been found to suppress every type of prostate cancer there is. And then there was a study out of MD Anderson uh, two years ago that looked at people that were uh, eating the most cruciferous vegetables, dramatic decrease in the incidence of lung cancer. So it protects against all types of cancer. The reason for the lung cancer is most likely there's another nutrient in the cruciferous vegetables called sulforaphane. It's probably the most powerful uh, elevator of um, detoxifying enzymes of any nutrient that we know of. So one of the other things that is an epidemic now that is promoting cancer is uh, either being diabetic or being pre-diabetic. It's being over 10% of your ideal body weight. And we know that elevated people with elevated fasting uh, serum sugar levels have a 27% increase in cancer mortality amongst men, 31% increase amongst women. Now, why is that? 
because every time you eat white sugar, you know, refined sugar, things or anything with a high glycemic index, glycemic index is, just means how much insulin does it take to metabolize a given food. So you want to stay away from refined sugar because those have the absolute most. Things like high fructose corn syrup containing things. Every time your uh, pancreas makes insulin, your liver is making something called IGF, or insulin-like growth factor, which we can measure. And that's one of the strongest tumor promoters there is. So if you're walking around pre-diabetic, you're walking around with high IGF levels and one of the strongest tumor promoters there is. So the main things that I tell people, if you want to reduce your risk of cancer, inflammation. So chronic inflammation can come from things like too much alcohol, uh, infections, uh, colitis, uh, you know, arthritis. There's a number of, uh, there are a number of inflammatory conditions. A lot of people are walking around with a bacterial overgrowth in their stomach called H. pylori, have gastritis, and it's key to measure uh, certain indices of inflammation, um, which you know a lot of integrative practitioners are doing now, and there are a number we can measure, and we can get those levels down. There are some genetic predispositions uh, people have also toward inflammation, but those drive cancer. Oxidative overload, that comes uh, partly uh, from inflammation, but it also comes from a lot of uh, food additives, uh, pesticides, herbicides, all those uh, create DNA damage that produce oxidative overload. Um, glycemic overload, we just mentioned, and I'm going to talk a little bit more of that, but you want to avoid white sugar and white flour. Uh, go with whole grains. Best bread you can keep in the house actually are sprouted whole grain breads like Ezekiel because those contain enzymes. They help uh, digest it. And then detoxification is critical as we discussed. Alpha lipoic acid. Uh, that's a very important uh, nutrient for people to take. A lot of people need a supplement to that for a variety of reasons. It's an antioxidant that helps reduce free radicals. It improves insulin sensitivity, so uh, your body won't have to make as much insulin, and thus not as, mo as much insulin-like growth factor. It improves glucose transport, so insulin helps glucose move into cells, and we recommend between two and 800 milligrams a day. Um, then there are what we call angiopreventative compounds. This is critically important. So there are two types of what we call angiogenesis, the growth of new blood vessels around tumors. A lot of the latest cancer therapies are involved in inhibiting abnormal angiogenesis. So let's say if you cut yourself or you have surgery and you look at those blood vessels under a microscope, it's this beautiful array, very symmetrical of uh, blood vessels. So you want some angiogenesis. It's a completely different process than when a cancer starts to take over and it uh, takes the blood supply. This is like this dysmorphic morass of blood vessels. Everything about it is different, all the growth factors that create them. So there are a number of ways that inhibiting this abnormal angiogenesis. And that has to, that's one of the important things to, uh, to do with keeping cancer cells dormant. So there are nutrients in soy. Uh, there are things in milk thistle, uh, quercetin in apples, resveratrol in red grapes. Uh, green tea is loaded with EGCG, which inhibits only the abnormal angiogenesis, turmeric, uh, and uh, St. John's wort. There was a paper recently published, How Many Ways Does Curry Kill Cancer? It's about 25 different ways. I could uh, give you a two-hour lecture just on turmeric. It has a host of other uh, properties as well, including anti-aging. Green tea, uh, one of the cheapest, best things you can do to lower your risk of a variety of different types of cancer. Uh, the main two that have been studied are breast and prostate cancer, but even people that consume the most green tea, uh, when they have cancer, they live the longest. Uh, so critically important on a number of levels. Um, it also inhibits angiogenesis, and it's also been found uh, to actually help chemotherapy work better. Uh, whole grains, uh, those are important uh, in uh, 
you know, for, they're fermented in the uh, colon. They uh, yield something called short-chain fatty acids. They help improve insulin and glucose. Uh, metabolism is also loaded with B vitamins. Uh, vitamin D and breast cancer. Uh, we know everybody should know their 25 hydroxy vitamin D level. Uh, that's the one that's associated with a lower risk of cancer. We know that women with the lowest 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels that's related to your intake of vitamin D3. Now, you're not going to know how much D3 to take. If you eat a perfect diet for D3, you have salmon, you have cottage cheese, you have dairy, the most uh, you're really able to get is about 250, 350 units in a day. Uh, the least somebody needs that's living uh, at least around here or where I practice in New York uh, is about two to 3,000 units a day. And some people are just very poor absorbers of vitamin D3 like me. I take about 50,000 units a week just to keep my level uh, normal. So everybody's different. You can't guess. You've got to know your D3 levels. But it lowers your risk of every type of, of almost every type of cancer, but especially breast cancer. And a study uh, came out about two years ago showing that women with the very lowest vitamin D3 levels when they were diagnosed with cancer had about a 90% increased chance of developing metastatic disease. There's been a lot of misinformation about soy and breast cancer. Again, I could give you a two-hour lecture, but I'll give you the bottom line. Uh, dietary soy consumption, even if you've had breast cancer, uh, does nothing to increase your chance of the cancer coming back. Uh, and in fact, there was a big article, a big retrospective study where they looked at a lot of studies uh, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association looking at women that were consuming soy versus not and found it uh, increased uh, disease-free survival. Um, and the estrogens in soy are about uh, one one thousandth is the estrogen in the human body. A uh, study that was published in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute in 1998, they just looked at women that drank two glasses of soy milk a day compared to those that didn't. Uh, and they found that there was about a 25% drop in serum estrone and serum estradiol levels. So estrogens that were a thousand times more powerful than the ones found in soy dropped by about 25%. So the net estrogenic effect from soy is you've got a lot less estrogen in your body. Studies have been done in people with prostate cancer, uh, with sort of lower grade prostate cancer that either elected to have prostatectomy or radiation or just changed lifestyle, went vegetarian, started doing yoga, exercising more, having green tea. And actually in the uh, group that was doing the lifestyle change, their PSA uh, actually decreased. In people with precancer of the prostate, a uh, very nice study was done, and this has been repeated, looking at uh, an extract from green tea in people that had what's known as PIN, or prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia. Almost all those men will go on to develop prostate cancer. And uh, so there were nine cases of prostate cancer, and the ones that weren't consuming any green tea, only one uh, one year uh, in the ones that uh, were consuming the green tea. And that 30% incidence per year is consistent with the literature. So green tea critical for both men and women. Now, there's a very old drug called metformin. It uh, came out in 1955. So I take metformin just preventatively. Um, and I give metformin to a lot of my patients with cancer and that are interested in wellness that are over 50. Uh, and the reason uh, is it originally came from the French lilac. It had been used in European folk medicine for about 300 years before. They noticed that there was 40% less cancer over the ensuing decades uh, in people taking metformin compared with those that weren't. And then there was a fascinating study published three years in the Journal of uh, Clinical Oncology and Breast Cancer. Uh, they wanted to look at diabetic women with very large breast tumors that had to get chemotherapy to try and shrink it down to make it operable. And the, some of the women were on insulin, some were on the newer drugs, Actos, Genuvia, some were on metformin. So they just wanted to see how diabetic women did with this type of chemotherapy. To their surprise, they found that there was a threefold 
increased incidence of complete remission, meaning when they went in to do the surgery, there was no cancer at all, even under the microscope in the women that were taking metformin. We're seeing the same thing in men with prostate cancer now, uh, even after it's already developed. It's becoming almost routine to put these people on metformin. Metformin will lower your insulin-like growth factor. It increases uh, insulin sensitivity, but it does something even more powerful. It turns on a host of tumor suppressor genes. So this is an example uh, you know, of a very old drug that's off patent that people can't really make any money on anymore that very few people know about when the scientific literature uh, is so strong uh, in support of using it both for cancer prevention and treatment. Exercise, absolutely uh, critical. There's a hormone release from your muscles uh, after heavy exercise called irisin, and that's been associated with anti-aging. It's been associated with what's called longer telomere length, with ha which has to do with the length of your DNA strands. Uh, so exercise is one of the most important things you can do to improve in insulin control, uh, glucose control, anti-aging, uh, and anti-cancer is as important as any food. Um, and the precautionary uh, principle uh, Dever and I have written papers on this. Uh, it came uh, from Richard Horton, uh, editor-in-chief of Lancet, and I just uh, want to read this because it's so important for all the work that Environmental Health Trust is doing right now, uh, and it's been important for all the work that I've been doing uh, over the last 25 years, and it says we must act on facts and the most accurate interpretation of them using the best scientific information. That does not mean we must sit back and wait until we have 100% evidence about everything. So, you know, that's what, uh, you know, a lot of the polluters like, even, you know, with DDT, uh, and I could name a number of other, at least a dozen other things that were proven to be carcinogens, but only, you know, the chemical industry wanted to demand 100% proof, prove that it's harmful. And, you know, with the precautionary principle is saying is proof that it's safe uh, where the health, where the state of health of the people is at stake. The risk can be so high and the cost of correct, corrective action so great that prevention is better than cure. Uh, and then where there are significant risks of damage to the public health, we should be prepared to take action to diminish those risks even when the scientific knowledge is not conclusive, if the balance of likely costs and benefits justifies it. You know, you'll have people tell you, well, you have to have 100% evidence. You know, if you wait for proof of harm, most often it's going to be too late. And these are just uh, some of the websites uh, for uh, the speakers tonight. And I'd like to just close uh, by giving you a little analogy. Uh, we all fasten our seat belts before we drive our car uh, to avoid fatal auto accidents. Uh, we brush our teeth to prevent tooth decay. I hope I've given you enough information now to see that there are a number of steps we can all take to prevent ever developing cancer. Thank you. <laughs>